Likely the hottest prospect in the Reds organization, Ellie De La Cruz has seen his stock go through the roof recently. And today we have Justin Rock, the play-by-play announcer for the Daytona Tortugas and the man who had the firsthand knowledge in watching him explode onto the scene this past season. Justin's going to talk about how awesome and the wow factor that Ellie De La Cruz carries with him. He's also going to talk about the provisions of the minor leagues and how that's going to affect players and what, what it was like for the Daytona Tortugas to go from high A to low A. Lots of great stuff coming up on a packed Locked On Reds podcast as Justin Rock joins Stephen Offenbaker and myself. Let's jump right in. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All righty, for today's Locked On Reds, Steve and I are very, very privileged to be joined by the voice of the Tortugas, the rock himself, Justin Rock. First first question, Justin, has, has anybody ever called you the rock? Uh, yes, uh, very much. There, there have been plenty of jokes uh, about that from uh, from high school to college to uh, professional life. It uh, it has always followed me uh, for whatever reason. Uh, <laughs> I can't I can't imagine why. Well, I don't mean to make it sound like a joke or anything. We are very happy to have you on. Appreciate you taking a break. I know that you're in the middle of basketball season, getting to be the voice for the Army women's basketball team. And thanks for taking a few minutes to talk some minor league ball with us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Happy to do it, guys. Happy to talk about baseball and think about uh warmer things as we're expecting some snow here up uh, New Jersey way uh, in the next couple of hours or so. Yeah, I, I'll, uh, I'll let Steve uh, take the trump card on the snow. We actually did get a little bit of snow here in Cincinnati, but uh, nothing like what he's been through. Oof. Yeah, I was, I was part of that mess uh, in Seattle. I was traveling at the time and I got stuck on in two different cities on the same day because of snow. It was, it was pretty miserable. That does not sound like my uh, idea of a fun afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, let's have some fun. Let's talk about some baseball. And it, really the first question that I wanted to ask you, because we're in the midst of a wonderful lockout, but I know that the lockout hasn't necessarily affected the minor leagues like it has the major leagues. What has your off season been like? Um, for the most part, it's really somewhat been the same. Um, you know, not much has changed from our aspect of operation on the minor league side, particularly since one of the main issues that will arise with the, you know, you know, the lockout coinciding potentially with the minor league season is players that aren't on the 40 man roster, uh, or that are on the 40 man roster can't play. And uh, so, you know, being a low A affiliate now, the odds that a player on the 40 man roster uh, is going to be a part of our team at some point during the season is very unlikely. As you've seen this year, a couple of guys that played there ended up being added uh, to the 40 man roster this off season, but not so much the other way around. So, you know, it had to change probably a few things in terms of, you know, who we promote on social media, unfortunately, um, but luckily the product on the field really should not have any effect come uh, opening day 2022. You mentioned uh, about being low A. What has that transition, what was that like during this past season? Because for those who don't know with the restructuring of the minor leagues, Daytona was the high A team and then they became the low A team and Dayton and Daytona kind of traded. Yeah, that definitely added to the uh, confusion that already was. Uh, between the Dayton and Daytona uh, transfer and the Reds organization. And now at first, you know, it sort of made sense. You moved from Dayton to Daytona, you added an A, you know, going up to high A. Now you lose an A as you go up a level. But, uh, you know, that was really one of the the, the main confusions. Um, there was some trepidation at the beginning from some fans in terms of hopping on board, you know, dropping down a level and, you know, there's some sort of stipulations and things like that. But talking with uh, not only our fans, but also our ownership group, uh, our owner, Bob Vergol, one of our owners loves to hop on uh, in our booth with us when he's in town during the season. And even he said that, you know, the reaction from the fans, while trepidatious at first, they really began to grow and even like it maybe even a little bit more. 
um, as the season went along, you know, greener guys, uh, newer players trying to get, you know, their feet wet in the system, getting uh, the newer draft picks as well uh, coming in uh, during the season. Players really hopped on board, uh, you know, and fans really uh, latched on to, to Ruben Ibarra and a lot of the, you know, the new draft guys. So although there was some, you know, hesitancy at first, uh, the fans in Daytona really uh, took to it. And I give them a lot of credit for that and not really griping about it and uh, just accepting and enjoying baseball every day at Jackie Robinson ballpark. Well, you know, Justin, with the, as Jeff mentioned, the lockout in process, there's a lot of changes coming to major league baseball at the, at the major league level. And some of that will trickle down, but major league baseball had made some changes already in the minor leagues. Uh, one of those changes was increasing the benefits for minor league players, as well as some of the, and benefits, not just money housing, but, uh, Things like uh, food that's available to them and, you know, the workout uh, availability and equipment and trainers and all of those types of things. What's been your reaction to the changes that Major League Baseball has made within the minor league system with those benefit increases? Um, it, it's huge. I mean, it means so much to these players. I mean, it, it really is not understated how, you know, how tough it is and how hard it can be for these guys during the season, particularly as has been well documented really over the last year or so is housing. When you're moving from affiliate to affiliate, especially this year, one of the things we talked a lot about in our front office was we anticipated a little bit this year because of COVID and all the restrictions that there would be less uh, roster movement this season uh, with the abbreviated campaign. But instead, the Tortugas, we had over 100 roster moves uh, during the season wow. with player movement. So it is such an important thing for players not to have to worry about that and worry about leases. And I think it's going to do a lot for them in terms of just the mental aspect of the game and not having to, you know, have that in the back burner of their mind, you know, worrying, you know, if I get promoted or demoted, uh, am I going to have to still pay rent for this? Uh, you know, what am I going to do if I, if I've got my girlfriend or wife traveling with me, uh, whatever it is. So I think that's great. There's a lot of details um, that need to be ironed out. And I'm really curious to see how it comes to fruition this year. But I will add this uh, when it comes to that kind of thing. And I'm not saying this just to try and, uh, you know, hype up the Reds organization. But one thing that they have done very well over the years is take care of their minor league guys. And you've seen reports throughout the course of this season and even back uh, in 2019 of different issues that players arose with, with their organizations, whether it be uh, housing or not getting, you know, good enough food and things like that. Um, I never heard that issue uh, when it came to uh, our players uh, in Daytona, uh, our players in Greenville when I was with them in 2018, when they were still a part of the red system. Um, so that's always been a really, you know, it's a weird thing to say, but it's always been nice to see that, you know, you know, when it's the guys you're working with day in, day out, um, that, that, you know, they're taking care of at least in some of the most basic ways possible. And uh, hopefully uh, I'm not speaking uh, out of turn and hopefully <laughs> uh, my guys uh, that I've worked with uh, haven't uh, led me astray and that they have had that uh, positive experience. <laughs> If I could follow up just on that, then is there somebody within each team, say in Daytona, is there a person that's specifically in charge of helping uh, these young players when they come in, find uh, their housing and, and help them to, you know, kind of get a lay of the land and, and learn to navigate the area? Um, it's a lot of a coordination uh, from what I've seen uh, between uh, the Reds and their de player development offices and really our higher ups uh, in Daytona, I got to give a lot of credit uh, to our general manager, Jim Jaworski, who goes so above and beyond. I mean, there was a time during the season, uh, you know, with such player movement, we had a lot of guys staying uh, in a hotel and, you know, they needed transportation to the field. And, you know, not every guy has a car, not every guy, you know, and especially now, with, you know, with the COVID stuff during the year, there, I'm sure, was some trepidation about taking Ubers and uh, carpooling like that to the ballpark. And so we rented a team van and Jim was 
you know, the team bus driver driving players to the field, uh, home from the field after the game. And, you know, right. you know, he didn't do it because someone asked him to do it. He did it because he felt it was the right thing to do uh, for somebody in his position. Um, and, and those little things obviously uh, go a long way uh, in terms of, you know, the minor league experience for these guys. And, <laughs> you know, you know, it, it's definitely a coordination effort. No, and I don't think the Reds expected Jim uh, to do that at any point during the season. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, the kind of commitment, at least that we make in Daytona to make sure these guys experience in terms of housing, uh, transportation, food, whatever, is as good as humanly possible and that their experience with us uh, is as good as humanly possible. Thanks for making Lockdown Reds your hashtag first listen of the day. We are free and available on all platforms. Coming up, we are going to continue our talk with Justin Rock about Ellie De La Cruz, and we are going to look at some other prospects, some guys maybe lesser known that aren't going to be on any lists, or maybe they might sneak their way on lists. That's coming up here in just a minute. Before we talk about that, though, I want to tell you about Built Bar. Look, it's uh, January, which is the national uh, time for New Year's resolutions, and yours is probably about getting fit. I know mine, I'm, I'm trying to get a little bit fit, and part of that is eating healthier. Make sure you include Built Bar in your plan. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, but maybe it's even better than that because it's made with 100% real chocolate, but the statistics are amazing. Built Bar makes it easier to stick to your resolution because it tastes so good. You'll want to eat it, unlike other protein bars, which can be chalky or waxy or taste like a chemical spill. You want to eat healthy, but it just gets so boring. By like week three, you might be thinking, ah, screw it, where's the chocolate? Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate, but they have amazing stats, like 130 calories on most Built Bars, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and like I said, most Built Bars up to 17, sometimes 18 grams of protein. And with flavors like cherry bar, see a coconut brownie chunk, salted caramel, you're going to think you're cheating on your diet when you're really right in the sweet spot. So go to Built.com, use the promo code, and get 15% off your order. That promo code's LOCKED15, by the way. Use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your next order at Built.com. All right, let's jump back into our conversation with Justin Rock. It's awesome because a grind doesn't even begin to describe a minor league ball player's day-to-day -day life. I mean, I, I know how much that they go through and the fact that most of them are not getting paid like a first round pick they're they're getting paid to really work their way up the ladder so it's it's great to see the tortugas are really reaching out to the place and with that many guys kind of rolling through all those hundreds of transactions you saw so many different guys to pinpoint one might be a little bit hard but this dude's stock has just been going through the roof here recently and la de la cruz i i gotta ask you justin whose stock is higher right now joe burrows or la de la cruz's um, I mean, I, I, mean <laughs> I feel like on the surface, you got to say Joe Burrow just because he's already doing it uh, at the highest level. Also, shout out to the Bengals. I'm, I'm a long suffering Ooh. Jet fan. So as someone mm -hmm. who now has ties to Cincinnati, I have definitely jumped on board uh, the Bengals bandwagon. I'm glad to know that the Jets win against them earlier this season. Didn't <laughs> screw anything up. They still won the AFC North. So uh, very happy for all my Cincinnati <laughs> friends out there uh, enjoying that ride. And hopefully they get that long awaited uh, playoff win, but I still, I can never forget. I'll never forget this as long as I live. Um, just when Ellie arrived in Daytona and you knew nothing about him, you looked up the stats and they blew you away for what he did in the, and the ACL. I was going to call it the AZL, what it used to be. It's not that <laughs> anymore. Um, and I remember texting people particular, uh, Doug Gray of Reds Leagues.com is like, do you know anything about this guy? Cause you're trying to do research before the first game, learn anything you can. And there was nothing, there was no details. And the response I got back was, you're going to be the first person to tell anybody what this guy is. We have no idea. And his first batting practice, I wasn't totally paying attention. I was doing prep and I see this string bean kid crushing the ball out of the ballpark. And I'm like, 
that can't be him. Like, there's no way this, you know, you know, kid who's, the, you know, the size of this Gatorade bottle, you know, is, is doing that. And sure enough, you know, within the first four days of him playing with the Tortugas, you know, it was like, this kid is unbelievable. And shame on everybody else for not picking up on this guy. Um, he was, he's just unbelievably fast. Uh, I mean, his, his ability to hit for power for a guy that really seemed like had no muscle mass was inc- just remarkable. His ability to play the field, his arm at third base and shortstop, his range. And I think most importantly, and you see it a lot in scouting reports about him right now, um, is his mental makeup. He, he wants to get better. He's, he's got that drive to, you know, you know, he's not complacent. He's not coasting on, on these new laurels that have come his way. You know, I remember making a comment to him that, you know, he wasn't part of Major League Baseball's top 100 prospects when they updated the rankings in the middle of the season. And he said, you know, he said to me, you know, like, not yet, you know, I- I'll get there. You know, so, you know, that's the kind of mindset he has. And you love to see that, especially for a kid who's as young as he is and who's, you know, come up on the scene really out of nowhere in such a short period of time. He's he's really getting a lot of love. There's a lot of people that are putting him in the top 10 list organizationally. When, when you look at the players and you think about the players that you've seen behind the mic for the Tortugas, where does he kind of rank as far as like just wow factor? Uh, I mean, in terms of guys, I've, I'll say that I've seen that have played for me personally, the teams that I've broadcasted for in my, I guess, now seven years of minor league baseball. I mean, he is he's on the short list. Um, I mean, the times, the the amount of things that he would make you say, just like, how is that possible in a game is astounding. I mean, if a ball got into the gap, it was no doubt a triple. It didn't matter if they were playing on the turf in Daytona, if it got a high bounce and the ball went over the right fielder's head, you know, or if it was just a ground ball in the gap, it didn't matter. He was getting to third base. And if they fumbled, anything was possible uh, from there. But just, you know, that and the raw power. And then the things he did defensively, there was one play I remember he made against a really fast player for the St. Lucie Mets that J.J. Cooper talked about at one point. I mean, he made, uh, you know, 95-plus mile-an-hour throw from foul ground and third base territory. Like Manny Machado, you know, Baltimore Orioles beginning of his career type of type of stuff. Um, so that level of wow was so incredible. And then being able to watch him and Reese Hines when he came back at the end of the season, which I didn't totally expect uh, for that final month was such, such a pleasure uh, on that left side of the infield. And then you threw Jose Torres in the mix. Uh, you had three guys who could play at an extremely high level on the left side of the infield. Um, that was, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. But, you know, Justin, you talk about guys like Torres and Hines and De La Cruz, and you're in a unique position to see uh, this young talent within the Reds farm system, you know, just as it's getting started, just as it's getting underway. So from your vantage point, how confident are you that the Reds future is trending up, that uh, we have you know, a lot to look forward to? You know, you mentioned those three guys and it sounds very exciting. Uh, what's your confidence level and what that's going to mean for the big league club for years to come? Um, I'm very optimistic. Um, obviously, I'm a little biased because, you know, I've worked so closely with so many of these guys uh, over the years, but there was so much talent in so many different places uh, this summer, whether it be guys that you expected to perform at a high level like Reese Hines um, or guys that came out of nowhere like Ellie De La Cruz and I think the best example, I know, you know, Kyle Bodie isn't in the organization anymore, but Brian Conger, who was uh, the minor league pitching coordinator this year, still is. And so many uh, pitchers, particularly on, on the relief side, just opened up my mind. Stevie Branch, Vin Timpanelli, uh, Carson Spires, he was with us very early in the season. Uh, I could really just rattle off a list of, you know, guys that were – you know, a, a tremendous credit to the Red scouting department, you know, in an era where so many scouts have been cut by organizations, 
Uh, it, it seems like the Reds have stuck by a, a whole lot of their guys, and I got to see firsthand uh, the benefit of that. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens this year uh, as they continue to develop, see guys build upon things. Um, but just the pure amount of talent that came in and out of Daytona Beach, you know, our roster looked so different on September 19th than it did on May 4th. But the talent level, although the roster changed so frequently um, and there were so many injuries, I, I really felt was high uh, all season long. So there's a lot of things, I think, uh, with this organization and with this minor league system, especially in the lower levels, uh, for Reds fans to be excited about. And as long as they can continue to, to keep developing these guys uh, as they had it this season, as we saw my guys from 2019, like India uh, and Alejo Lopez, and Jose Barrero make big strides uh, this year. Um, I, I think the sky's limit if they can continue to do that. You know, as Doug Gray said, you got to be the first person to kind of tell the world about De La Cruz. Is there anybody else on that Daytona roster right now that, that, that you would point at and say everybody's sleeping on that, that you can't understand why people aren't talking about them? Um, you know, that's one of the most fun things of working in minor league baseball is seeing those guys. Um, you know, I'm sure Jeff can remember some of the guys I brought up when we had this conversation uh, in the middle of the Daniel summer. Daniel Veoheen. Daniel Veoheen is one of the, the, yeah. the key ones. Um, he's going to be on top 30 lists starting this year. I know MLB.com actually put him on uh, in the middle of the season, uh, which is great. I, I loved his development at the plate throughout the season. Uh, such a good defensive catcher. Stevie Branch uh, was outstanding with us in Daytona and only got better after he got promoted to Dayton, which you love to see uh, day in, day out. Jose Torres, not a lot of, you know, everyone was talking about his glove uh, when he got drafted at NC State and joined our roster in Daytona. And he proceeded to tear the cover off the ball. So I'm really excited to see uh, what he does. Uh, in a full season of the minors next year, starting, I assume, uh, in high A with Dayton. Uh, but there were so many different guys from, you know, draft classes, you know, for example, Sam Ben Scooter, who was an undrafted free agent out of Michigan State, started two games in the final road trip of the season. And I mean, he had a filthy breaking ball and he looked like, you know, this guy didn't get drafted. I know his numbers in the, you know, Big Ten wasn't as good as they could be. But, you know, the raw, you know, the raw physical tools were there. Um, so thankfully, there were so many different guys down there in Daytona this season that may not be on the prospect radar yet. But if they continue to build on what they showed last year, um, they're going to be fighting for those spots uh, in very short order. Love having Justin Rock on the show. Coming up, we're going to talk about his chance to call a combined no-hitter for the Daytona Tortugas this past season. That's coming up in just a moment. Before we talk about that, though, I want to tell you about BetOnline.ag. BetOnline would like to wish you a happy new betting year as we continue the march to the playoffs for the NFL and beyond. BetOnline remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagering in 2022, and with a new year comes a new and updated desktop and mobile website that you can go and sign up today and receive a 50% welcome bonus by using that promo code locked on. From ba basketball to football, hockey, boxing, the UFC, there's baseball futures, there's even your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of this amazing introductory offer, and there's plenty of offers that will come throughout the year as well. Once you join betonline.ag, head on over there today. Use the promo code Locked On to get that 50% welcome bonus. Get your bankroll started in the right direction because BetOnline is where the game starts. Thanks again for making Locked On Reds your first listen of the day. Coming up next week, we're continuing our march through the minor leagues as we talk to Tom Nichols from the Dayton Dragons. He's going to give us an update on all things Dragons. Probably talk a little bit about what he saw from Graham Ashcraft and guys like that as he is on the podcast next week. Tom Nichols from the Dayton Dragons, joins us. Now, let's jump back into our conversation with Justin Rock from the Daytona Tortugas.
We're talking with Justin Rock here on this edition of Locked On Reds. And Justin, you've been gracious with your time. I appreciate you talking about all the different prospects and what's going on in this offseason. I want to ask you one more question before we let you go. It, it's been some time removed from the game, but you got the chance to call a combined no-hitter this past season. How do you remember that? Even now, when you look back on that game and you're just like, oh, man, like, like what comes to mind? Uh, just special. Um, it, it was, you know, the first time I'd ever called a no hitter for a team I broadcasted for, uh, I got to call one, uh, in a seven inning game when Frankie Montas started against, uh, the Tennessee <laughs> Smokies, uh, in I think it was 2016, 2015. I have no idea. He would have thrown one in a nine inning game. If it went, if the game was that long, he was that good that day. And, and there was one against Daytona, uh, combined one in Clearwater in 2019, which was weird to call. It was like the first nine inning no hitter you call, and it's against your team. And you're <laughs> like, do I yeah. like like enjoy that that I'm calling a no hitter or not? Um, but it was just such a special game. And you know, you brought up Steve, you know, under the radar guys, and that night was you know the prototype for that. James Proctor started that game, undrafted free agent out of Princeton. He was outstanding, had some really good starts as well in Dayton. I'm really excited to see uh, what he's going to do uh, in 2022, but he was outstanding to start. And that was really, you know, he had a great first start. That was his second start, but that was the night, that was the night obviously that opened everybody's eyes. Like, you know, this kid, you know, shoved it down their throat. And then, you know, you had Nick Hansen come out of the bullpen at one point where after Ricky Karcher threw one pitch, threw one pitch, threw it over the guy's head. And as someone who worked with him, he came back from Tommy John, my heart sank and thinking one, you know, is Ricky okay? And two, how are they going to throw a no hitter? If you got a guy coming out of the bullpen who wasn't expecting to pitch and Nick Hansen did, uh, did his job and threw that eighth inning, Vin Timpanelli threw, you know, got out of jams through the sixth and seventh. And then Carson Spires, his fine, one of his final outings, his last outing at Jackie Robinson ballpark wasn't even was in the starting rotation, his only relief outing with us. He comes out and closes out uh, a no hitter. And, um, you know, it, it was just a, an awesome night. And I think one of the fun parts was after the fact was finding out and then giving them uh, the business Forrest Herman, who was Daytona's pitching coach this year, uh, now in the Orioles organization, um, him telling me that night that it made it extra special because he's known James Proctor since he was a sophomore in high school. They were oh. both from the St. Louis area. And when Forrest was a pitcher at Evansville, James was going to the same facility in the St. Louis area. And after Forrest graduated from Evansville, he became James's personal pitching coach. And they got to connect again this summer, you know, in Daytona and in his third appearance, second start, back together he throw you know he starts off a no hitter and you know those are the memories that will stick with me you know forever because that was the first one it's, you know it's Justin, stuff like as, that i just yeah, i love that you know justin as a guy that that lives and breathes minor league baseball like you do uh, reds country geographically is is very big you know we've we've got listeners down in, in daytona's neck of the woods you know chattanooga louisville dayton uh, you know, for those people in those areas, can you speak for a minute about why they should embrace minor league baseball and why they should embrace their area teams and be paying attention to not only the Cincinnati Reds, but everybody between Daytona and Cincinnati? This I will give the biggest you know credit to. And I think a large part of it, as you said, Steve, is because of the you know breadth of, of Reds country is all four spots, all four spots, and even the two spots that unfortunately got removed, Billings and Greenville, uh, were all very dedicated to their teams. I know, you know, firsthand from Greenville, I know Billings for sure was, but Daytona has been so passionate uh, about the Tortugas. Uh, same thing with Chattanooga. I mean, though both those teams were on the chopping block, you know, you know this time two years ago. And, you know, working in the Southern League, 
uh, as you know, a broadcaster and working in the Florida State League as a broadcaster. Those are two of the more passionate fan bases uh, in minor league baseball. And the only reason they were on those lists was because of amenities. And I know both teams will take care of that in short order because the fan bases want it and the Reds want it. And, you know, Louisville and Dayton, you know, the attendance numbers speak for themselves. So I think one of the great things about the Reds minor league system is there isn't a whole lot you have to convince. Um, you know, the fans in those areas are so, you know, passionate about their teams, passionate about baseball, um, loving how the Reds minor league players interact uh, with those communities as well, um, you know, doesn't matter, you know, Daytona, you, there are players that are heroes from, you know, the Amir Garrett and Jonathan Indias all the way down to, you know, players who you don't even think about, you know, like Blake Butler, who was in the Reds minor league system many moons ago. Bruce Yari is still uh, a fan favorite in Daytona, you know, annals. So, you know, that's one of the things I've loved working about uh, in the Reds minor league system is the passionate fan bases, not just in Cincinnati, but throughout the minor league stops. Justin, thank you so much for coming on and talking with us today about the Tortugas and about some minor league baseball and uh, very glad to have you on. We'll definitely have you on again here soon. You can catch Justin on all things when it comes to army women's basketball and head on down to Daytona. I mean, I mean, the beach is right there. It's a pretty good reason to go anywhere is to go to the beach, but then you can also check out some awesome minor league baseball as well. I know I, I, I gonna try and get my wife to go down there. i think that's gonna happen i mean I, I mean if you need any convincing uh, the team posted uh, i think earlier this week an amazing uh aerial shot of the view uh, of jackie robinson ballpark i mean it is right on a man-made island uh you can get a history lesson it's where jackie robinson played the first integrated game after he signed with the dodgers you know it, it's right on the halifax river you're right you know walking distance from the world's most famous beach one of the best views uh, you can possibly get in minor league baseball. So it, you, you can't lose by coming down and be sure to say hi if you do. That'll do it for this edition of the Locked On Reds podcast. Thank you so much again for making us your first listen. Now make your second listen, Locked On Bets. Your boy Q and Lee Sterling help you make a couple of bucks over at betonline.ag with their amazing sports wagering info. That's Locked On Bets, just like Locked On Reds, free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And you know you need to subscribe. Whether you are uh, on your favorite podcasting app right now or you're watching right here on YouTube, make sure that you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss anything that we've got. Remember, Tom Nichols next week from the Dayton Dragons will be on the podcast to talk all things Dayton Dragons baseball with us. It might be the offseason, and we might be locked out, but we are locked on Reds every single day.